Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Hami. In today's program, we are going to talk about, uh, at the start, uh, the statement by the Inter Services Public Relations regarding Pakistan Tariq and Saab chairman targeting military and intelligence agencies officials for furthering the political objective. Later in the show, we'll be talking about the significance of the last week for Pakistan's foreign policy front as uh, Foreign Minister Bilal Bhutto Zardari participated in the Council of Foreign Ministers meeting of the Shanghai cooperation organization in Indian city of Goa, as well as India's undiplomatic and discourteous behavior. And also, Foreign Minister Bilal Bhutto Zadari's uh, bilateral meetings with the other members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization will also take up for discussion the trilateral meeting on Afghanistan as the Foreign Ministers of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China met in Islamabad to discuss the dire situation in Afghanistan also. We'll also discuss with our panelists about the crashing of a MiG aircraft of Indian Air Force uh, which has been known as a flying coffin for decades uh, within India as another aircraft crashes in Rajasthan into a house killing three people although the pilots of the aircraft ejecting uh, safely. So uh, let's talk about the first thing, uh, the statement that has been given by ISPR. Uh, the ISPR says, let me quote, that Chairman Pakistan Tariq Saf has leveled highly irresponsible and baseless allegation against a serving senior military officer without any evidence. This fabricated and malicious allegation is extremely unfortunate, deplorable, and unacceptable. This has been a consistent pattern for last one year, wherein military and intelligence agencies officials are targeted with insinuations and sensational propaganda for the furtherance of political objective. We ask the political leader concerned to make a recourse to legal avenues and stop making false allegations. The institution reserves the right to take legal course of action against patently false and malified statements and propaganda. Unquote. Let me uh, quickly bring in our panelists to discuss this uh, particular issue. Mr. Shokat Paracha, senior journalist, has joined us on the phone line. Mr. Paracha, thank you very much for joining in at Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. By looking at this statement that has been issued by ISPR, what's your understanding why uh, a certain um, party leader continuously uh, keeps on uh, targeting the military and intelligence agency officials and how uh, detrimental uh, it is for the overall outlook of his political party? Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting my comments on such a very, very important and highly sensitive matter because uh, right from uh, 10th of April 2022, uh, Imran Khan has been targeting uh, Pakistan Army one or the other way, uh, its leadership and the institution at large. Because sometimes he says uh, they are the conspirators and they hashed a conspiracy and uh, ousted his government, uh, forgetting that these were the very members from his own party who were fed up of his policies and they they refused to you know follow Imran Khan's dictates. Uh, then sometimes he says they are the Mir Jafir and Mir Sadiqs of this age. Then he says uh, uh, military neutrality is an animal instinct. And now you know b b since November when unfortunate firing incident in Wazirabad took place, he has been targeting us. He, senior sitting officer, unthinkable in the political history of Pakistan that some politician or party head would uh, level such a allegations against a senior officer. Even today, when ISPR has uh, 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 given a very mired, yes. mature, and uh, responsible, and, uh, logical, logical statement, statement, still I still believe I they have shown, I mean, I, ISPR has shown a lot of restraint. And still they have uh, uh, shown a uh, uh, way which is legal one, which is as per the law of the land. Because the statement, as you very rightly read uh, for your viewers, the statement uh, very categorically provides that instead of making baseless allegation, uh, Mr. Imran Khan, without naming him in fact, you know, a head of political party, it has been used the word, 
that he should uh, go for the law and what what is the law the law is the court you know otherwise the impression is in the country that wherever imran khan goes in the courts the courts are inclined to uh, give grant him the bail or you know grant him the with the opportunity to be there you know courts are waiting for him till late hours because uh, we often we see in islamabad whenever he is uh, appearing as an accused he is bringing thousands of people uh, with him uh, so to me still a restraint uh, 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 behavior and attitude and uh, and and their outlook restrained outlook from the military but there is always a limit and if uh soldiers of a professional army they are stunted and tainted and uh, alleged you know this way uh, they the soldiers always respond but still they are talking about law of the land that law is there uh, the opportunity before uh, the law is equal in pakistan as has been uh, shown for the last many months that imran khan is getting bail he has not been put behind the bar you know despite his arrest warrants you know he is still uh, sitting at his house uh, but i tell you you know uh, uh, there is always a limit you know i cannot say more right. beyond beyond this word but this practice you know uh, should be discarded uh, after this statement i tell you right uh, mr paracha rightly so when we talk about this particular statement by the ispr it goes on to say that we ask the political leader concerned to make a recourse to legal avenues and stop making false allegations so when we talk about this approach by the pakistan tehreek e insaf leader uh, imran khan uh, rather than taking a legal course if he has got any sort of a problem or a concern with the uh, concerned institution uh, why do you think he goes on making public statements uh, rather than uh, taking that legal course i think the people surrounding imran khan and imran khan himself has discovered that by making these allegations and taking a stance which is oftenly uh, said as uh, an anti establishment stance or defi- defiance in this country uh, he thinks that he is getting very popular his popularity is skyrocketing just because of the statements otherwise you know uh whatever term he served over three and a half years nobody is talking about his performance his ability to govern the country his ability to steer uh, the country towards uh, uh, growth and development you know all he has uh, taken the course of discussion is about his allegations about his uh, stance that that has uh, been purely against the state institutions and particularly the army and its top leadership every day you know he comes up he comes up with a statement against former chief of army staff general bajwa and others you know so he thinks that he this stance and this rhetoric against the military and military leadership has given rise to his popularity in the country but so don't you think I it's going to be detrimental in the longer run for his own political party by hurling such false allegations against such an institution it never happened in pakistan that any political party or a political leader is talking against uh, the military leadership so consistently so continuously you so uh, that's why i said there is a limit always you know and uh, and uh, there are many sane people within party which is called pti pakistan tehreek and saf they must be watching all this and many of uh, 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 some friends in that party whenever we confront them in our shows uh, they they publicly say that uh, whenever we are sitting with mr khan we we try to prevail upon him that this stance is uh, unrealistic it it cannot lead to a, a success in pakistan and with and and in their interaction imran khan also agrees that yes i will not again reiterate what i say but according to his own colleagues his party men now when they leave and some other you know uh, 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 some other party men you know who are very close to him or or he is surrounded by them when they come closer to him you know his stance changes so that's a problem within the party and it this statement today i tell you i i i do not want to repeat but i have to repeat that this statement today 
must have some consequences and let's see what consequences uh, they they recur in coming days right mr paracha one last question regarding this particular statement at the last um, uh, this particular statement says that the institution reserves the right to take legal course of action against the patently false and malafide statements and propaganda uh, what options do you think um, the uh, this particular institution does have if this particular pattern by pakistan tehreek e insaf leader continues to happen in future also when i say the response today or the statement today is mired it is logical it is uh, uh, reasonable uh, i say on the basis of the very statement a uh, very part of the statement that you have quoted that the institution has the right for legal recourse and legal recourse is there i mean uh, you are leveling alle allegation against a very senior officer and uh, uh, you know putting very odd names on that officer uh, law of the land does not permit article 19a of the constitution of pakistan it provides freedom of expression but with certain restriction as imposed by law in relation to defense of the country foreign relation religion etc etc so defense of pakistan means security institution if if is a false allegation is leveled against them uh, it can be proven in one hearing in in a in a court of law that these are the false allegation without any uh, concrete evidence and those who level against the, the such allegation against uh, the the institutions there is punishment provided in the law so it's very easy to 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 uh, try and get the people punished who are uh, leveling such allegation but still you know they have not resorted uh, going there but they have forewarned it right to mr shogat paracha senior journalist thank you very much for taking time out uh, for views on news tonight really appreciate that uh, viewers let's uh, move on to the next topic as uh, pakistan had a foreign policy successes during the last week when we talk about foreign minister bilawal bhutto zadari's participation in the council of foreign ministers meeting in indian city of goa of the shanghai cooperation organization and then uh, we saw the entire world saw india's undiplomatic and uh, discourteous behavior towards uh, pakistan's uh, foreign minister and uh, the kind of remarks which have been given by indian uh, minister of external affairs um, that also garnered huge criticism uh, from uh, multiple uh, critics uh, as well as the analysts uh, uh, then we also will be talking about the trilateral meeting on the dire situation in afghanistan the foreign ministers of pakistan china and afghanistan met in islamabad now the chinese and the pakistani side of urged the afghan authorities to take a heed on the security concerns and the concerns regarding uh, terrorism of the neighboring countries and uh, do some concrete action against the terrorist outfits which are operating from the afghan soil uh, the chinese and the pakistan foreign ministers also uh, agreed upon to help afghanistan uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance as well uh, we've also seen the afghan acting foreign minister amir khan mutaki also saying that uh, the afghan authorities hope to live in harmony with its neighbors let me bring in pen our panelists on this particular topic we are honored to have been joined in the studio by mr hamza rifat husain his expert in international relations mr hamza thank you very much for joining in at views on news tonight really appreciate that and on skype at the same time we are being joined by dr sayed akhtar ali he is senior analyst uh, dr sayed akhtar ali thank you very much for your time also for being with us on views on news tonight we really appreciate that um uh, let me start uh, th the discussion with you Dr Ali uh, when you. we talk about uh, Pakistan's uh, foreign policy success how do you think Pakistan has been successful in conveying its position on multilateralism during the CFM of SEO also uh, raising uh, the concerns regarding uh, the settlement of the disputed territories over there also I uh, it's referred to me Dr Ali yes please go ahead Yes of course uh, uh, during this last one week uh, Pakistan has the honor to host uh, uh, Chinese uh, foreign ministers visit here and the foreign ministers visits in Pakistan and similarly the foreign minister of Pakistan attended 
uh, SEO conference over there in Goa. So in both these uh, uh, parlays and conferences, uh, Pakistan has emerged uh, a key player as far as uh, regional uh, politics and diplomacy is concerned. And Goa initially, uh, certain uh, reservations were raised. Uh, they were apprehensions that uh, Pakistan may not uh, participate. There was a propaganda, I would say. But uh, by dispelling that operation, Bilawal Beto participated. And he very ably uh, educated the Pakistan's uh, security concerns uh, and Pakistan uh, policy on and highlighted uh, and enlivening the Pakistan stance on Kashmir as well and uh, the security issues within the region. And, but at the same time, I would say that on part of the India, uh, the, throwing all the uh, diplomatic loans uh, to win and, and even the Eastern values which we enjoy within uh, India and Pakistan. Uh, the Indian foreign minister uttered certain uh, words which were not at all appropriate. But uh, in response to that, I would say, say, young, he has played cool, and by logical argument, he countered the allegation of uh, Indian foreign minister uh, and establishing. And because of uh, the background which he enjoyed, um, because of uh, then uh, his mother, Abelazir Bhatto Shaheed, who had been fighting against terrorism. So they are assembled as far as, as, far as uh, against terrorism. They were themselves the victims of terrorism. So before the world, no bad body can raise a finger that Pakistan is the promoter of terrorism. Uh, right, uh, let me then go to coming to the Shanghai. Uh, please go ahead. Dr. Akhtar Ali, uh, please Sorry. complete your thought. Please go ahead. And then now, as far as the, the hosting of this uh, conference in uh, Islamabad, the visit of the Foreign Minister of China and uh, Afghanistan. So it again demonstrated that Pakistan is a key player within the region without Pakistan engagement and Pakistan participation, even China and uh, the Central Asian states uh, cannot go forward. So Pakistan, it also reminds me the role Pakistan had once played while bringing the United States and China together to shuttle them up diplomacy. So uh, it again proves the point that even if you have the worst enemies, you have to at times keep them engaged in talks. So the criticism that Pakistan, that Afghanistan has, has not been recognized and uh, Taliban, they have uh, assumed power, they have a de facto authority, but at the same time, China had, uh, had all along been also an educate that they must be engaged and Pakistan is also having the similar. So uh, from that point of view, and before that in Doha, even uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations had held a conference on these issues, how to keep uh, the Afghanistan engaged so that uh, the things uh, doesn't uh, go worse. So it's a step in the right direction uh, in order to uh, pave way for a conducive, uh, peaceful atmosphere in the area. Right, uh, Dr. Akhtar, uh, 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 rightly so. Uh, I'll come back to you uh, with this particular point to discuss deeper into detail regarding Afghanistan, the situation in Afghanistan, how the international community should be engaging with it. Uh, we are joined by another participant, uh, Mr. Asif Durrani, his former ambassador. Hamza, I'll come back to you. Sure. Also, I I'll take your view on um, these issues also. Mr. Asif Durrani, thank you very much for joining in at Views on News tonight. We really uh, appreciate that. Now, uh, regarding the behavior of Indian external affairs, 
Affairs Minister, Mr. S. J. Shankar. Uh, how uh, do you think such a behavior uh, when a certain country is hosting and it has itself invited the foreign minister of another country, no matter how big a foe it happens to be, now this kind of behavior uh, and uh, the kind of remarks he has given during his press uh, in Goa, what does it depict? Well, I think it should be now clear to everyone that uh, India's so-called hegemonic attitude and transigence uh, has come in full circle. And uh, Mr. Jashankar, in fact, was reflecting that uh, in his statement. Uh, the manner he, he, he tried to criticize the uh, uh, manner he tried to despise Pakistan uh, and uh, repeating the mantra of epicenter of terrorism, uh, alluding to Pakistan. Actually, in fact, uh, 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 India itself, uh, I would rate it as mother of terrorism, and they have, in fact, uh, are the point in the region, especially with regard to their help to educate in Sri Lanka. They have been involved in uh, anti-communist movement in uh, Nepal, they have squeezed the Bhutan. They have had all uh, manners of interest in Maldives. Now they have squeezed Bangladesh. Uh, Awami League of uh, Sheikh Hasina, in fact, is now beholden to India, whether it's an election. Now elections will be held in Algeria uh, next year in Bangladesh. And then there are reports from the Bengali commentators that uh, Indians have applied all pressures. India has been applying pressure on to join the Asia Pacific Alliance, in the Pacific Alliance. So these are the tactics. So here, with the regard to Pakistan, never accepted the Indian hegemony. This is reflective of, and um, it was very clear that Pakistan never wanted to have bilateral unless it was to August 2000 position. And um, for that, the questions are very clear because India violated uh, the UN resolution and the Shimla agreement is also very clear that uh, no party uh, bring any kind of issue uh, as far as uh, uh, Kashmir is concerned, uh, despite <coughs> without the issue on Kashmir. This is something they have done. It. That also shows the economy. So, in, in a manner of speaking, India has exposed this, and now, in fact, they have become the spoilers in uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, they have, in fact, uh, almost destroyed SARS uh, by not attending SARS summit and sabotaging it. And uh, now they are, in fact, uh, they are applying the ointment as far as Shanghai Cooperation Organization is concerned. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, let me uh, proceed with the discussion. I'll go to Mr. Hamza. Mr. Hamza, uh, how successful do you think Pakistan's um, of foreign policy regarding um, its decision of attending the CFM at SEO that happened in India, of course, mm -hmm. was, and how successfully Pakistan conveyed um, its position on the major pressing issues uh, that the region is particularly faced with? Well, I think, first of all, if you take a look at it from a larger context, we need to take a look at the interview that uh, Mr. Rajdeep Sardesai had with Foreign Minister Bilal in the interview, he tried to corner Pakistan. He tried to label Pakistan as a state sponsor of terror. But uh, Mr. Bilabal Bhutta Zardari answered with grace. He answered with alacrity. He answered with vision. He gave factual information and statistical data as well as far as Pakistan's ability to get out of FATF not once but twice. So that gives Pakistan that added edge as far as Indian propaganda is concerned. Uh, in terms of conveying uh, diplomatic signaling, I think uh, he had a session with the Russian foreign minister. When it comes Sergio to the uh, question yeah. of terrorism, also Pakistan also asked about um, India's Kulbushan Yadav also, who was caught red-handed in subversive activities over here in Pakistan also. And you also talked about the Samjota Express. And uh, we also recently saw a detailed presser by Pakistan's Interior Minister Rana Sanawal and Minister of State for Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. regarding India's state sponsorship of terrorism also.
Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about Indian subversive activities, that is precisely what they've been doing in Pakistan. Whether it's trying to stoke unrest uh, as far as Balochistan is concerned, or whether it's trying to diplomatically isolate it by you know, creating a trilateral front when you have Afghanistan to the west and you have Bangladesh to the east and you have Nepal in the top. And when we talk about uh, you know, Bilabal Bhutto Zadari's diplomatic success, I think his session with uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov of Russia was excellent and showed that Pakistan is not uh, in any sort of camp politics per se, but they're looking forward to a balanced, mature, and sensible foreign policy. When we talk about um, you know, India's attempt to try and puncture Pakistan's narrative, in that very uh, interview, he, um, uh, Mr. Rajdeep Sardesai also suggested that uh, Pakistan's minorities and the plight of minorities in the country is under question. But if you take a look at it from a larger perspective, that happened just one day before the Manipur violence took place, where two tribes, one a Hindu tribe and the other one the Christian tribe, was actually uh, fighting over resources in a, a hilly area in the, in the state. And what happened was that the BJP government then you know, unleashed a state-sponsored terrorism by trying to eliminate both tribes. So that is the reality of India. When we talk about secular democratic India, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari's presence in the SEO uh, FM's moot uh, ensured that Pakistan is uh, presenting a diplomatically mature and secular democracy, Islamic secular democracy credentials in contrast to India, which has witnessed democratic backsliding. So it's a massive diplomatic victory. I think the fact that Pakistan had the option of actually boycotting the SCO moot um, and the fact that Pakistan did not resort towards that shows that we are all for engagement, but not at the cost of Pakistan's national sovereignty, not at the pa uh, cost of Pakistan's national security. So how do you analyze this statement by Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari of weaponizing the myth of terrorism for diplomatic point scoring? Absolutely. When we talk about weaponizing the myth of terrorism, Pakistan has suffered the most uh, from terrorism, from state-sponsored attacks, whether it's from Afghanistan, whether it's from India. And the fact that, you know, the uh, earlier point that I alluded to, that FATF, when we talk about FATF in general, Pakistan did not exit FATF once, but it exited FATF twice. So it shows that, you know, the people of Pakistan have sacrificed their lives, their blood, uh, their resources in, the com uh, in combating terrorism. And to label Pakistan as a state sponsor of terrorism is, uh, you know, it's, a c it's not only a complete uh, fallacy, but it's also ludicrous on part of, you know, journalists such as Rajiv Sardesai, who tried to paint Pakistan in one light. We've, uh, you know, when we take a look at uh, so many different statements that have come across uh, from the current government and the previous government, we're trying to shift from geosecurity to geoeconomics. We're talking about the progression of CPEC. We're talking about, uh, you know, 5G technology coming into Pakistan. There have been various ministers who have been speaking about that as well. So we're looking forward to the prospect of regional connectivity. We are not a state sponsor of terror as India wants to paint us as. And uh, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari's uh, you know, entire statements that he made at the particular moot uh, just buttresses that claim. Right. Uh, let me go to Dr. Sayyid Akhtar Ali also. Dr. Sayyid, uh, when we talk about uh, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari's press uh, after uh, his participation in Goa, uh, he uh, urged India to work collectively in order to eliminate the menace of terrorism. So um, do you think India should be taking this matter up seriously? Rather, uh, if, if it doesn't uh, take it up so seriously, it clearly speaks volumes about India's uh, complacency uh, and um, uh, being itself the perpetrator of cross-border terrorism. Uh, yes, of course, uh, India has to demonstrate uh, uh, by their actions, by sharing uh, intelligence uh, with Pakistan and uh, dispel the impression, uh, the impression regarding their involvement in uh, Balochistan and, uh, and even uh, in Afghanistan where they have their proxies we had been waging uh, cross-border terrorism within Pakistan. So they have to provide uh, data to Pakistan so Pakistan can also take uh, action against them. Uh, but Pakistan at the same time, the foreign minister of Pakistan, uh, by citing that Pakistan is a multicultural uh, country with ha having more democratic credentials, by offering uh, ministerial sorts and even uh, uh, offering them uh, births in the National Assembly and in the Provincial Assembly to the minorities. Whereas compared to that, within India, the BGP has uh, not offered any seats to the Muslims and even indulged in the terrorist uh, acts against the minority. So it uh, establishes one thing 
that uh, they have a myopic uh, uh, point of view as far as the politics within India even is concerned. So to the world, they have to prove by their deeds and by their actions that they are not involved in human rights violations, in uh, terrorism, as far as Pakistan is concerned. Right, uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor, after one uh, related question, this, the foreign minister also said they uh, talked about the Mumbai attacks of 2008. He said uh, there is a Mumbai trial ongoing within Pakistan. The reason that the trial has not progressed is because India is refusing to send witnesses. Why do you think India is hesitant to send witnesses to Pakistan for this particular trial to get completed? Uh, you see, the truth will come to the surface. The witnesses will be put to the cross-examination and the things will uh, be clear for Indians that if they send witnesses, the whole picture will be before the world. And uh, the allegations uh, which are against India regarding their involvement Pakistan right uh, mr mr durrani uh, when we talk about india's external affairs minister um, his behavior the kind of remarks he has um, hurled against pakistan uh, when we compare um, uh, Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari's calmness, uh, yet he conveyed emphatically and very forcefully Pakistan's position on key matters. On the contrary, we saw that uh, sort of a temperament and the kind of body language uh, in Mr. Jay Shankar. What sort of a message in the Committee of Nation does it send um, when a certain country is hosting a multilateral event and it invites itself, the Foreign Minister of another country, yet behaves in that way? I think uh, it all shows that uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, he lacks uh, civility and uh, that's not the way diplomats behave or diplomatic norms are. And this is uh, what uh, I think I'm sure the SCO member states may have noticed. And uh, on the contrary, uh, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari's attitude, his uh, demeanor and his way of uh, responding to even uh, harshest of questions was quite impressive. He never uh, lost his school. He was uh, on track. He was focused. And he responded to all questions put by Mr. Desai. And uh, in fact, Mr. Desai looked as if he is, in fact, uh, one of the interlocutors uh, in a public meeting. So he sounded like a BJP fellow. But to forget about that. He has, he's a journalist of standing. But here, I think he also got emotional and he wanted to plead in this case rather than putting questions as a journalist, as a mutual journalist. But that also, uh, having said that, Raul Bhutto, Dr. responses were calculated. He never lost his school, and he was very impressive. There's no doubt about it. Even uh, some international commentators, they have praised the way he responded to the Indian journalist question. Right, uh, Mr. Durrani, the foreign minister also said that Pakistan always desired peaceful relations with uh, India and also looks forward to a dialogue. But uh, there is no question of a meaningful dialogue with India until the illegal unilateral actions of 5th of August 2019 are reversed. Uh, do you think India is going to seriously think about this aspect? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I have my doubts. Uh, at least till the time the BJP is in power. Uh, Mr. Modi is in power. And uh, again, uh, you can see that uh, the effects of Pulwama uh, incident uh, is now former uh, occupied Jammu Kashmir uh, Governor Satya Pao Malik. He has felt being, and uh, in fact, the blame goes to the Indian government. And uh, their Home Minister Amit Shah, in fact, he asked the governor to keep his mouth shut. This is something, and, and that incident led to their uh, misadventure at Balakot. And from Balakot, of course, they got the response uh, within 24 hours uh, from Pakistan. And then their pilot was captured here in uh, Pakistani territory. So, and the world has changed. 
Pakistan behaved maturely. The, the pilot was returned, uh, I think, within 72 hours. So, uh, but uh, it was the major pretext to go for August 5th, 2019 action. Um, but uh, it has, in fact, uh, not given any legitimacy. India never enjoyed legitimacy in the occupied Kashmir, and they will never enjoy legitimacy in the Indian occupied Kashmir till the time they, in fact, respond to the UN resolution. And uh, an illegal act is an illegal act, uh, come what may. They may try, they may try to use, um, uh, you know, military muscles, they may try to gag the voices in the occupied Kashmir of the people, but it's an irony that whatever action they have taken in the occupied Kashmir, their leaders cannot dare to go to the Indian occupied Kashmir, in the occupied valley. They just cannot walk on the street. No, they blame Pakistan for terrorism, but they don't understand that the sentiments in the occupied Kashmir is absolutely against India. They don't forget that it was the intifada-like situation in the occupied Kashmir, which is why Indian authorities they resorted to pellet guns and blinding the youth uh, on the street. So it has further, uh, uh, you know, it has further created the hatred, which is already, you know, full of hatred. That's why it is. So here we have to look at it. India, in fact, they perhaps they may want to change the demography of of the occupied state, perhaps that is in their mind, but that would be illegal. Actually. Whatever action they want to take would be illegal. Till the time, the two parties, Pakistan and India, they in fact are involved and the Kashmiri people uh, are given the right to exercise their right to self-determination. Till that time, till that happens, every action taken by the Indian government, and especially under Resolution 91 of 1951, which clearly states that any change brought by India would not amount to the exercise of right to self-determination by the Kashmiri people, period. So it's very clear. Whatever India is, uh, whatever actions India is taking are illegal, immoral, and uh, you know, it lacks fairness. It's in a cool form. It is absolutely in an uncivilized manner that uh, Mr. Modi's government has taken the action. Yes. Right, Mr. Asif Durrani, former ambassador, thank you very much for joining in at Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. Let's talk about that trilateral summit between Pakistan, Afghanistan, and China regarding the dire situation in Afghanistan. How significant was that, the timing of it, uh, the kind of issues that have been discussed in it? We have seen uh, foreign ministers of Pakistan and China urging the Afghan authorities to take heed of the concerns regarding terrorism of the neighboring countries. Uh, do you think, uh, after we have seen uh, the continuous violations by the Afghan authorities, they were unable to control? control the terrorist outfits operating from the Afghan soil to launch um, terrorist attacks against uh, neighboring countries, especially when we uh, saw upsurge uh, in the terrorist attacks in Pakistan uh, that were perpetrated by banned Tariq Taliban Pakistan. Do you think the Afghan authorities are going to take this particular issue seriously this time around after this trilateral summit? Well, I think if you take a look at the trilateral summit in general, this comes just months after Iran and Saudi Arabia's rapprochement was brokered by China. So it shows the maturity of Chinese diplomacy along with allies such as Pakistan to try and relay the message to the Taliban government that whatever you could say security covers being provided to militants, that is unacceptable. It's not only uh, security considerations for Pakistan. Obviously, we've been a victim of terrorist violence, cross-border violence for quite some time. We've had, uh, you know, the TTP basically operates under the umbre umbrella of the TTA. So unless the TTA does not signal to the TTP that their actions are completely illegal and uh, they will be prosecuted against, peace cannot return to Pakistan. But if you take a look at uh, Jabad, uh, China's context as well, I mean, the rest of Xinjiang province, um, the East Turkestan Islamic movement and the fact that you know there are allegations that China has incarcerated so many different uh, uh, Muslim Chinese uh, Uyghurs uh, in these uh, in these camps. I mean, in order to try and nullify the potency of the ETIM, it's important for Afghanistan security situation to actually be addressed, and it is also important for regional connectivity prospects as well. You know, there's a lot of coverage in the international media and in mainstream Pakistani press that CPEX should be extended into Afghanistan. That's only possible if the security situation is actually addressed. So, uh, coming to your question. 
often, um, I mean, this is the backdrop of it. I think the Afghan government should understand this is not the Americans negotiating with them. These are the Chinese. They have a very different diplomatic approach. They think not um, you know, in a on a transactional basis, but they also think 35 years, 40 years ahead. And Pakistan, which has tried to you know, broker peace in Afghanistan, whether it's through the Murray peace process or through uh, the Quetta Shura, it is also a legitimate player in this entire scenario. So bo both countries are coming up with a different diplomatic tone as far as Afghanistan is concerned. And it's very, very important for the TTA government in Kabul to change course. Because if they don't, then the spillover effect would not only inf uh, you know, impact Pakistan and China, but it will also impact resource-rich uh, Central Asia as well. And we know uh, what would happen to the BRI investment prospects, uh, particularly in the post-pandemic era, where GDP growth rates are being compromised. Right. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, why do you think the Afghan authorities uh, have been unable to take that concrete action against the terrorist outfits uh, over which uh, China has concerns, as uh, Mr. Hamza has also said, the East uh, Turkestan Islamic Movement, as, as well as the Ban Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, over which Pakistan has concerns. Do you think after this trilateral summit and the bilateral meetings with the Chinese Foreign Minister and the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, the Afghan authorities are going to seriously uh, take up this matter and ensure that the Afghan soil is not used against their uh, neighbors uh, uh, to get those dividends uh, that the regional connectivity offers to them? Um, I think that uh, this initiative will have effect on the Afghan government. But there were two threats which have been made from Afghanistan. One is and the other is the uh, Taliban Pakistan. Uh, as far as the uh, Islamic State of Khorasan is concerned, so they will uh, initiate action with full throttle and uh, China has more concern regarding uh, Islam, th this uh, EGM uh, and uh, Islam, uh, Islamic State for Hassan than the Tariqa Taliban, Taliban Pakistan. As that is uh, the Afghanistan government would take uh, full action. But as far as uh, Tariqa Taliban uh, Pakistan is concerned, still I think the Afghan government is more focusing on, 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 on Right, uh, Dr. Dr. Athar, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Unfortunately, we're having a little bit of distortion. Uh, Hamza, let's talk about uh, the crashing of uh, another MiG uh, aircraft in Indian state of Rajasthan. Now, um, according to statistics, um, uh, according to AIFP, uh, during the last 60 years, there have been 400 accidents of MiG-21 and uh, that have resulted in 200 pilots uh, getting killed. Now, in this particular um, incident, we have seen uh, the crashing of uh, this MiG-21 uh, aircraft into a house. Mm -hmm. The pilots ejected all those safely, but it resulted in loss of life. Three people got killed. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Oh, don't you think the pilots ensure that if there is a problem that occurred uh, with the aircraft, they ensure that it uh, shouldn't be falling into uh, a populated area, rather they should divert that plane to some unpopulated area? Yeah, well, you know, whatever has happened in India is something which is symptomatic of what happens in some country in sub-Saharan Africa without the technological prowess to try and, you know, navigate through uh, civilian skies, for that matter. I mean, it's absolutely bizarre that India claims that, you know, their air force or their, you could say, aerial combat record or the safety record is, you know, it's very stellar. But in reality, it's basically, you know, it, it has so many flaws within it. I mean, uh, this uh, incident that you actually refer to, to actually land uh, not only in, you know, a civilian population, Populated area, but also in the house of a private citizen, is it just shows that the Indian Air Force is extremely reckless. They are capable of doing absolutely anything, and uh, you know it goes back to the Pulwama attack and the subsequent aerial combat between Pakistan and India. India's uh, you know tall claims that they can actually you know uh, you could say demoralize their enemy uh, by you know in in uh, creating incursions into you know the enemy's airspace uh, was completely exposed to a large extent. And one of the reasons why that has been happening is because of the very fact 
fact that uh, Pakistan's overall Air Force record is far more stellar in terms of the safety standards are concerned, and where, whereas India, you know, lacks in terms of its lapses uh, to a large extent. Right, so it, it just shows that India, uh, it, it's it's more bluff rather than anything substantial. Right, Mr. Hamza Rifat Hussain is expert international relations, joining us in the studio. Thank you very much for your time. On Sky, we were joined by Dr. Sayed Athar Ali, uh, senior analyst. Uh, Dr. Sayed Athar Ali, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on Views. Appreciate that. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.